Chapter 13. Loss. I haven't written in this journal for almost two months. During this period, my life has been filled with more failures and successes than in all my previous years put together. I was going to say that I've been too busy to write it all down, but I know that's only partially true. Truth is that I didn't want to write down all my failures, only my successes. Unfortunately, my conscience wouldn't let me write one without mentioning the other. Finally, the same conscience insisted that I bring my journal up to date. With only a month left to attain Level 3 awareness, it should prove helpful to me to review the past two months. My problems, just like everyone else's, have been caused by my refusal to accept the macrocosmic truth that all failure leads to success, and that all success leads to failure. That is, to another lesson we have not yet learned. So I'll begin with a success that became a failure. It has to do with my relationship with Nada and my desire to change her life from unloved ugliness to at least a minimum of enjoyable attractiveness. I had Carl, with the help of one of his girlfriends, buy Nada some new clothes and provide her with enough of our research data to keep her busy typing. Meanwhile, I worked on her with macro powers of telepathy and PK. I continued to bombard her mind with positive accepting thoughts which kept her happy and hopeful regarding the future. In fact, during the first month of my NADA project, I spent almost all my waking hours in 1976 focusing my mind on her, not only sending positively reinforcing thoughts, but also suggestions as to what she should eat, what exercises she should perform. I was determined to improve her physical appearance as soon as possible, and I knew PK, the power used in all healing, could not be expected to do all the work that was needed. I was pleasantly surprised, though, at how much PK could accomplish if carefully directed and applied to the gland and nerve centers of the body. I spent some part of every day back in 2150 learning from CI, the seemingly miraculous e-mental healing and growth principles discovered by the Macro Society research. I learned that the mind and the emotions direct the formation of our physical body and all the changes that occur within it. CI described this process as an automatic reflex called the cellular response, with every cell of our being faithfully playing the part prescribed for it by our mind and emotions. With the help of CI and this new information, I began to use my growing PK power, my mind, and my emotions to change Nada's physical structure and to stimulate within her a joyous cellular response. This created an inner beauty, while PK created the outer beauty. My progress at first was extremely slow, and I was becoming discouraged and doubtful that even three months would be enough to make any significant changes in Nada's facial appearance. But then, toward the end of the fourth week, I developed the clairvoyant ability to not only see her aura, but all seven glandular systems and every nerve network in her body. Now I could see clearly how to direct my PK force and also the immediate results of my efforts. From that day on, my progress became so rapid that Carl went around shaking his head and muttering to himself. By the end of the fifth week, I was finished with the physical transformation of Nada. She had been five feet eight inches tall. She was now five feet ten. She had weighed 105 pounds. Now she weighed 150 pounds of sensual, curvaceous female flesh. I had modeled her as a composite of Leah, Carol, and Diane of my Alpha. While I could not quite reach their perfection, I had succeeded beyond my most optimistic hopes. As for Carl, my success was almost too much. A couple of evenings after I had completed my work with Nady, he came back from one of his ever-longer visits to her apartment demanding a talk with me. I have no more doubts about your incredible macro powers or about your macro society of 2150, but do you really know what you've done to Nada? What do you mean, I ask? You know what I've done. I've taken a physical and psychological disaster and turned it into a victory for beauty and tranquility. Well, as for her physical beauty, Carl replied, I cannot possibly have any complaints. How you managed to change that face, nose and all, into this delicately lovely one, I'll never be able to comprehend. She's a pure joy to look at. I have to drag myself away from her. Having picked up his thoughts, I broke in. But you're not happy with her psychological transformation. Carl gave me a long questioning look before saying, I don't understand you, John. Don't you realize that she's not only your physical creation, but also your mental one? She thinks only what you want her to think, and you won't permit her a very wide range of thoughts. For instance, you deny her the right to have any doubts or concern about the future. Wait a minute, Carl, I interrupted. What's wrong with helping her feel confident about her future? 
Damnation, John, he exploded. She's not a puppet. Even though you seem to think you're her puppet master, she has a right to develop her own strength by making her own mistakes. You're like the over-possessive parent who won't permit the child to make any mistakes. Also, the parent won't have to feel uncomfortable. And what's the result? You know as well as I that when a child isn't permitted to learn how to cope with the problems of this micro-world, he becomes angrily dependent on the parent and totally lacking in self-esteem. Good Lord, John, all our months of research, nobody knows that better than we do. You rescued her from one stinking, lousy, miserable parent relationship and put her right back into another one with you as the parent. At first I was hurt and angry that Carl couldn't appreciate my great and unselfish work with Nada. I sent a telepathic command to Nada to come to our apartment so that she could help me refute Carl's accusation. By this time, I had so attuned Nada's mind to mine that I was confident she would soon be with us. My one disappointment was that I had not been able to develop any macro powers in Nada, for while she would respond to my telepathic suggestions, she didn't recognize them as coming from me, so true telepathic communication between us had been impossible. As I waited for Nada to join us, I tried to be as fair as I could in considering Carl's accusations. It was possible, I thought, that perhaps I had gone a little too far with my desire to protect Nada from unhappiness. But surely I wasn't treating her like a puppet. I felt that this accusation was over-dramatized and exaggerated, particularly after all I had done for Nada. I decided to tell Carl about some of my other selfless macro-activities. Carl, I said, last week I went to our university hospital and successfully practiced my PK healing powers in two cases of terminal cancer. Unaware of my efforts, they underwent surgery, mostly because they would rather take the chance of dying swiftly under the surgeon's knife than slowly under the attack of cancer. Guess what? Two miraculous recoveries. However, some of the skeptical medics are now claiming that their tests must have been wrong because no one could completely recover from that much cancer so soon. Carl shook his head slowly and gave me a weary smile. You're trying to convince me that you only do good for others. I suppose you feel that there's no disease you can't cure with your macro powers. You're right, Carl, I said. I've walked through every ward in that hospital and have healed dozens of the most challenging cases. Why, in just a few minutes, I completely healed a patient who had been shot through a lung and a kidney just the night before. He was dying when I found him waiting for surgery. I almost completely healed cases of diabetes, tuberculosis, arthritis, pneumonia, epilepsy, heart disease, multiple cirrhosis, syphilis, cerebral palsy, and kidney malfunction, as well as an impressive list of fractures. Okay, okay, Carl injected. I believe you. But Nate has been standing here in our doorway, and I think we ought to invite her in. Carl walked over to Nate and invited her to come in. Then he asked if she had come up to get more material to type. Oh, no, she replied. I've got plenty to keep me busy. After all, you do run down and bring me more material every hour or so, and I'm pretty well supplied for the rest of the week. Yes, I laughed. I think dear old Carl here has developed a passion. I paused and then continued, for getting out at least three or four books full of material on our research. Carl looked a little flustered as he said, You know, we were terribly backed up on our typing, and I really enjoyed having the services of a full-time typist. I laughed again. I noticed your growing enjoyment. I've got to admit that I've rarely seen you so filled with joy as you have been during the past few days. Uh, yes, well, I... Uh, Carl began lamely, then looked at Nada and forgot what he was going to say. You wanted to ask her, I prompted, why she had come here. Oh, yes, Carl nodded gratefully. That's right. Nada, um, is there something we can help you with? Oh, no, Nada answered flashing her now lovely smile, which revealed the stunning white perfection of new teeth I had molded for her. It was just that I suddenly got the feeling that John wanted to talk to me. <laughs> well, you did, huh? Carl said, giving me a suspicious look. You were just suddenly overwhelmed with this idea in the midst of your typing. That's right, Carl, Nate replied with another dazzling smile. I couldn't concentrate on my typing and felt that I had to come up here and see what John wanted. Okay, Svengali, Carl said, glaring at me. I want to thank you for providing the evidence to support my earlier comments. At least you can now remember a past lifetime as a slave master, so we don't have to figure out where you got the practice. Now, Carl, I said, that isn't fair. I just wanted Nada to tell you in her own words how she feels about her new life. Oh, John, Nada exclaimed. You know, I never dreamed I could ever be so happy. In fact, it's also impossible 
I mean, my new appearance, my new life with you and Carl. I have to keep reminding myself that it's not all a dream, which will end with me waking up as the ugly creature in that nightmare life I lived before we met. Well, Carl replied, if you're so happy, Nada, why is it that you haven't once left this apartment building since you came here? Why did you stop attending classes? You're just about resigned to the human race. But I haven't wanted to go out, Nada answered. You and John have brought me everything I've needed. As for my classes, I thought my work on your research was much more educational and important right now. After all, Carl, I added, it was you who kept loading her down with enough work to keep her busy 24 hours a day. Okay, Carl nodded. I apologize for that. And I'll admit to both of you that most of the time when I was bringing you all that work, Nate, I just wanted to see you. I never saw anybody as beautiful as you've become. I just couldn't stay away. But now I've admitted this. You won't feel like you have to type all the time. You can go out and get some exercise. Oh, I get lots of exercise, Nate replied, especially since John bought me all that exercise equipment and encouraged me to use it regularly. Yeah, I know, Carl said. But Nate, don't you have any desire to see somebody besides John and me? Are you saying that I should want to see others? She asked. Because if you and John want me to go out and see others, I'll be glad to. Oh, God, Carl groaned. Do you hear that, John? She doesn't have any desire except to do what we tell her to do. And that's mostly what you tell her to do, either telepathically or in words. Suddenly, I felt a chill run through my body. Nada, I said. I may have to go away and never be able to return, so what would you do then? Carl and I watched her beautiful face slowly congeal in fear, and we recognized the light of terror well up in her eyes. She began shaking her head and moaning her disbelief piteously, while I watched Carl cast an accusing glare at me as he took her in his arms and murmured soft reassurances to her. Great tears dotted her ebony cheeks, and she shook her head back and forth refusing to consider the possibility that I might someday leave her life. I tried to send her positive, happy thoughts, but my mind seemed to have become numb, and I slowly realized that my telepathic contact with her was futile. I was too upset to be able to control my mind. I kept thinking over and over, what have I done? What have I done? It was some time before Carl and I could sufficiently reassure Nada so that Carl could take her comfortably back to her apartment. By the time Carl returned, almost an hour later, I had done some hard thinking and come to some painful conclusions. The first thing Carl said was that he wanted to talk to me some more. And I want to talk to you, Carl, I replied. I realize now that what you were saying about my being a puppet master or a slave master was true. I couldn't stand the thought of failing to make Nada happy, so I took over almost complete control of her mind. I... I didn't realize until this evening how completely dependent upon me she had become. No, not how dependent upon me she had become. Rather, how dependent upon me I had made her. Carl shook his head slowly. You were having fun playing God, he said. You know the old saying that power corrupts? According to your account of 2150, power doesn't corrupt macro man, but it sure as hell corrupts micro man, and that's us, John, you and me. Yes, I nodded, and while I've developed some macro powers, I haven't learned to use them unselfishly. Raina warned me that if I used my new powers selfishly, I would make myself very unhappy. I was sure that I had nothing to fear since I was using them unselfishly, or so I thought. Now I realize what she meant. Then do you realize, Carl questioned me, that you were bragging when you told me about all those people you had healed at the hospital? Do you realize that you were predominantly serving your pride, not people? I nodded my head in painful admission and said, There's another ancient bit of wisdom that says, Anyone who exalts himself shall be humbled. Okay, Carl said. I'm sure that if I'd suddenly developed macro powers, I'd have misused them too. I'd probably have wiped out half the world's population by now, especially those bastards who know they're polluting our planet but just keep right on doing it, pad their own micro pockets. I probably wouldn't have even healed people out of pride. I'd have killed them out of hatred. But your problem now is to undo the damage you've done to Nada. I'm sorry as hell, I apologized. I had no intentions of ever hurting her. Then thinking it over, I added, I could be dangerous, Carl. Well, I'm not worried about that, John. Let's just get Nada back in shape before you go on any more projects. In the next few days, I worked to teach Nada the principles of macro philosophy. I was pleased to see how quickly she learned to grasp the concept. For I knew that if she could see herself and others through a macro perspective, 
She could not be fearful, lonely, or dissatisfied with any experience. After a week as her personal evolution tutor, I gave her this journal to read. I had talked it over with Carl beforehand, and while he at first was opposed to introducing her so quickly to the strange concepts presented here, he finally agreed to it on the basis that we didn't want to be overprotective. Our decision was vindicated by the enthusiastic reception Nada gave to the concept of the macro society and by her acceptance of my desire to leave the world of 1976 and become a lifelong member of the macro society of the future. While the macro philosophy and P.E. tutoring helped Nada, the severance of our unhealthy dependency relationship would have taken much longer to complete if Carl had not fallen so completely in love with her. He devoted almost every waking moment that he wasn't teaching to being with her. It was he who got her out of the apartment and introduced her to the world of dating. However, he wasn't successful in getting her to return to classes for the very good reason that the girl who was a university junior and had enrolled in courses under the name of Nada Crixley no longer existed. It was at this time that Carl came into our room one evening after a date with Nada and told me that he didn't know what to do about the legal problem of Nada's identity. What are you talking about, I asked. Well, Carl answered, we couldn't get her back into her old classes because her professors and classmates would never recognize her or accept her as Nada Crixley. We thought of enrolling her under a fictitious name for the next semester, but we finally realized that they won't accept her without past school records, and we won't be able to figure out how we can come up with acceptable fake records for her. Well, I said, I'm sure you can figure out something. Doesn't sound too difficult. Yeah, Carl said, giving me his crooked grin. I haven't told you all of it yet. Seems Nada's mother called the university and found out that Nada stopped attending her classes and that the psychology department has no record of her doing any typing work for any of their research. How did you find out about that, I asked. Well, there was a notice on our department bulletin board, Carl explained, listing her as a missing person and requesting that anyone who knows anything about her whereabouts get in touch with the campus police. Hmm, I said. Maybe I better call her mother and get this all straightened out. Carl shook his head. I wouldn't advise it, he said. I talked it over with Nada, and she thinks her mother's looking for her to get money from her now that she has a job. She'll want to see her, and we certainly can't produce the body of Nada Crixley. That's for sure. In other words, I said, you think the mother will charge me with kidnapping, possibly murder. Exactly, Carl nodded. And neither she, the police, nor the jury that convicts you is going to believe your story, although it may help you cop a plea of insanity. For the next couple of hours, we argued about the necessity of talking to Mrs. Crixley. Carl was strongly opposed to this and kept telling me the idea of finding a new identity for Nate and just letting her become one more unsolved missing person case. I pointed out that she had her name on the apartment mailbox in the lobby and her telephone was in her name, which would certainly make it fairly easy for the police to find her when they really started looking. With Carl still protesting, I insisted that I would see Mrs. Crixley in the morning and try to convince her that her daughter was safe, even if she couldn't see her. I went to sleep that night wondering how I was going to convince her. Back in 2150, I had my first precognitive experience while talking with Raina. I'd been practicing review of past lives when suddenly the vision of being interrogated by two policemen imposed itself on my consciousness. I had a strong feeling that this was coming in the very near future. When Raina agreed with me, I told her about my 1976 problem with Nada's identity, and we discussed ways of handling it along with their probable consequences. A wise personal evolution tutor never tells people what to do, but rather helps them see their problems from a more macro perspective, then explore alternative solutions and their probable results. So I received no simple solution. However, I did decide on a course of action which seemed to provide the best long-term results for Carl and Nada. I immediately went to sleep in the tutoring room with the strong desire of waking up early in my 1976 morning. I awakened at 5 a.m. and telephoned Nada with a request that she get dressed and come down to our room as soon as possible. Then I woke up Carl with the announcement that the police would soon be at our apartment and at Nada's. He didn't ask me how I knew this. He just wanted to know how much time we had before our visitors would arrive. I told him that I thought it would be in a little over two hours and that Nada would soon be joining us for breakfast. By the time Nate arrived, Carl and I had dressed and shaved. As we ate a hurried breakfast, I outlined my plan of action. First, we would move all of Nate's belongings into Carl's station wagon. Fortunately, she still had not acquired more belongings than the wagon would easily accommodate. 
Then I suggested that Carl pack a suitcase for himself and leave with Nada for the adjoining state where they could get married and begin a little honeymoon trip. Carl grinned and said, Huh, now that's the best plan I've heard yet, John. I hope Nada thinks so, too, he added, taking her hand in his. Nada gave Carl and me a lovely, shy smile and admitted that she, too, was delighted with my plan. With their agreement to this first part of my plan, I began supplying the next steps. First, I would teach Carl's classes and give out the story that he had eloped with his beautiful new girlfriend. She would get married under the false name of Nada Daly and be Nada Johnson for the rest of her life. At first, Carl was worried about the legality of their marriage if Nada used a false name, but Nada said that she didn't mind as long as Carl loved her. Then she added that if 2150 could get along without any marriages at all, they should be able to survive on a slightly illegal one. After breakfast, I helped Nada carry her belongings to the car while Carl packed his suitcase with enough clothes to last a couple of weeks. We had agreed that Carl would call me at the end of the week, and if he couldn't reach me, he would contact Snuffy for information from me. A little before 7 a.m., Carl and Nada waved goodbye and drove off in the dim early morning light. At 7.15 a.m., two policemen knocked on our apartment door. They showed me a university picture of me, which they said that Mrs. Crixley had identified as the person who had abducted her daughter. I explained that while I had hired Nada Crixley as a typist and rented her an apartment, she had not liked the work and had quit both her job and the new apartment a couple of days ago. I then invited the officers to examine the apartment she had so recently vacated. They not only searched Nada's apartment, but also mine. I was extremely grateful that the police of 1976 did not have highly developed clairvoyance of some of my 2150 friends, for if they had, they would have seen the electron heat tracings of Nada's body, which would still have been present in her bed. When I explained that my roommate had left the day before to go on a honeymoon with his new bride, they, at first, exhibited considerable interest in getting in touch with Carl. However, I showed them a picture I had recently taken of Carl and Nada, and they could see that his new bride bore not even the faintest resemblance to the missing girl. I concentrated with all my macro power on convincing the two officers that they need not arrest me, because I'd be glad to visit their police station that afternoon and submit myself to a lie detector test of everything I had said, and for any further questions they might wish to ask me. I succeeded so well that they agreed to drive me to the university so I wouldn't be late for Carl's first class. That afternoon, after teaching all three of Carl's classes and joking with the students about his elopement, I went to the police station. There I found that the two officers had had real trouble explaining to their chief why they had let me go that morning. I was just in time to prevent their being sent off to bring me in. Once again, I repeated the story that I had given that morning concerning Nada, but this time I was hooked up to a lie detector and was questioned by the police chief and two hard-faced detectives. My ability to control my mind and thus my body naturally made the lie detector support my story. Then, tremendous macro persuasiveness got me released in spite of a rather unpleasant confrontation with Mrs. Crixley, in which I strongly planted the suggestion in the minds of police that if any harm had come to Nada, Mrs. Crixley was probably a partner to it. When I left, she was taking her turn at the lie detector. During the following week, the local newspaper featured the disappearance of the missing college student with a picture of Nada. Two other coeds had disappeared in the woods near campus recently. Their bodies, raped, murdered, and buried in the woods, had been discovered only two weeks ago, so the first thought was that Nada, too, had become the victim of their murderer. One look at the old picture of Nada, however, made it difficult to entertain the possibility of a sex crime, and since her parents were virtually paupers, it was a certainty that she hadn't been kidnapped for their money. I made one more visit to the police station, at which time I discovered that the police had made an exhaustive study of my life history, which did not support the theory that I was a kidnapper and murderer. As a crippled Vietnam War veteran and a respected graduate student, who was more interested in his studies and doctoral research than in girls, campus politics, or student hijinks, I didn't fit their concept of the criminal type at all. By the end of the week when Carl called, I was so optimistic about my relations with the police that I told him our problems were over and to enjoy his honeymoon. However, he insisted on returning with Nada so he could finish teaching his classes. They returned on Sunday and moved into Nada's apartment as Mr. and Mrs. Carl Johnson. Following morning, Carl resumed his teaching, and Nada resumed her typing. While Carl and Nada were interviewed by the police, I managed to be present during the questioning and succeeded in convincing them that these two people could not possibly have been connected with the disappearance of Nada Crixley. So ended Nada Crixley. 
In the case of the missing co-ed and the recovery of the bodies of the other two brought the fear and tension of our university community to a fever pitch and provided me with my second precognitive experience. It was on Sunday, exactly one week before Carl and Nato had returned, that I awakened with a clairvoyant impression of Central Park, not far from the 109th Street entrance. I clearly saw two vicious-looking men chasing a young girl. In the vision, I knew that these two men were responsible for the rape murders of the two co-eds whose bodies had been recently discovered. I woke with a sense of urgency that I must get to the park immediately. It was only a matter of minutes before my precognitive dream would become a material reality. Ten minutes later, I approached the park, wishing that I had my magnificent 2150 body. It was a little before 7 a.m., and the park appeared to be deserted. I realized that I could spend a long time wandering through it without seeing anyone at this time of day. Then I began using my telepathic power, like a radar, to sweep ahead of me through the heavily wooded park. I must have walked along the concrete pass for almost ten minutes before I picked up the thought of a young girl, whom I could not see because of the rise between us. As I focused my mind more closely on hers, I realized that she was riding a new bicycle along the paths of the park. She had been doing this every morning and evening, before and after school, since she had received it as a gift for her 13th birthday recently. I stopped walking in order to concentrate all my energies on telepathic contact with the girl. I waited right where I was, since I felt she would soon be riding into view over the ridge nearby. The trees stood sharply black against the cold morning sky. A recent thaw had melted most of the snow, leaving isolated dirty little piles around clumps of shrubbery or beside walkways. Suddenly, my mind contact with the little girl chilled my bones. She was being harassed by two men on motorcycles. I visualized my body as feather light and started a grotesque hobble run that soon brought me to the top of the ridge. I looked down upon the wooded path and saw the girl running through the trees, followed by two shaggy-haired young men in grimy motorcycle togs, just as they had appeared in my vision. The little girl had left her bicycle behind in hope of finding protection among the trees, but the men had abandoned their cycles and were fast overtaking her. I reached out to touch their minds and encountered lust and menacing glee as the tall one with a long, droopy mustache caught a handful of the girl's long, blonde hair. I watched with mounting terror as this dark-visaged man slammed the girl to the ground, then clasping both hands about her waist, lifted her like a banner high in the air. His pudgy companion grabbed her and began slapping her with huge ham-like hands as they both ripped at her clothing. Waves of red rage crashed through my mind. I slipped back in time and became once again the Indian medicine man fighting white soldiers who were raping and killing the women and children of my tribe. I found myself running faster and faster toward these monstrous invaders. Suddenly my elbows dug into the hard, wet ground and I cursed my crippled body for failing me. I was still some thirty yards from the enemy. The little girl's heart-rending scream of anguish snapped me back to the present, and I shouted at her assailants as I struggled to my feet. They looked up at me with surprise. The pudgy one laughed at the audacity of a one-legged man trying to interfere with two of them. I headed toward him. When I was within ten feet, I launched myself at his legs, managing to knock him down. We rolled about on the ground as his pudgy-faced youth tried to get room to slam his fists into me. I tried to stay close and harkened back to my army hand-to-hand -hand combat training. I felt his huge fist slam against the side of my head, and for a couple of moments I was lucky just to be able to hold on to him. My rage had made me clumsy, but now with cold, angry ferocity, I began slashing at his face and throat with short, powerful karate chops. With a scream of frustration and pain, he broke away from me and got to his feet. They were shod with heavy, lethal-looking boots. I telepathically picked up his murderous thought of stomping the life out of me with them. This gave me the split-second margin I needed, and the boot whizzed harmlessly past my face. I grabbed it, and with a sharp twist brought him to the ground. Before he could recover, I began slamming my fist into his jaw with all the strength of my rage. How long I kept at this, I don't know, but another scream from the girl brought me to my senses, and I realized that I was beating at an unconscious face. As I looked up, the tall fellow was sprawled on top of the little girl, mauling her small round breasts with one hand as he tore the last bits of her clothing with the other. I was up and bounding toward him, my voice shrieking madly at the top of my lungs. He leaped to his feet and came charging toward me, shouting obscenities. Again I threw a body block and we fell to the ground, but this time my opponent was too quick for me and I found myself pinned to the ground, 
with a luring mustached face bending above me as two powerful hands dug into my throat slamming my head against the ground again and again i redoubled my efforts to break loose but his hands were like manacles and his arms like heavy steel things were getting blurry there was no air and only one hope i let my body go completely slack for a moment the iron grip on my neck continued then with one last painful thrust relax as i tried to maintain some degree of consciousness i felt his hot face above mine my thumbs leaped for his eyes and scored two agonizing hits with a piercing scream, he fell backward and began rolling on the ground in frantic, pain-driven frustration. I tried to breathe deeply to recover as much strength as possible. Then, as he rolled toward me, I raised both my arms and with every ounce of desperate strength slammed my hard wrists down on the back of his neck. There was a sharp snap, and his body went limp. I staggered to my feet and hobbled warily to where the girl lay naked on the ground, wet and cold. She had either fainted or been knocked unconscious, and she had not been raped. I dressed her in the torn clothing, then wrapped her in my top coat and began reaching out for her unconscious mind. When I contacted the fear and terror there, I sent powerful reassurances that all was well and she was completely safe. Using PK and clairvoyance, I worked with her body to speed up the healing of her bruises. Soon her eyelids began to flutter. As she opened her eyes, I began to speak softly but confidently about how she was all right now, and would be able to ride her bicycle home without any trouble. I helped her to her feet and made sure that her own coat was buttoned as well as possible with its remaining buttons before retrieving my own. With both my vocal and telepathic assurances, she mounted her bike, thanked me for helping her, and rode off quickly toward her home. I considered having her call the police and confront her attackers at the police station, but decided to spare her that ordeal. Instead, I decided to deal with her assailants myself. What I was going to do with them, I wasn't sure, but I decided to start by taking them back with me to our fourth-floor apartment, which was vacant. There I could confine them until I decided what to do with them. First, however, I would have to heal them and set my hypnotic control of their actions so they would obey me. I walked back to where my last adversary lay sprawled out and began my clairvoyant examination of his injuries. It didn't take long to realize that he was dying from a broken neck. I began working to repair the damage before it was too late. I had learned from C.I. that the healing powers of the greater mind are unlimited if used properly. The problem was to stop the struggle of the patient's microcell so that the healing process could take place. In less than 30 minutes, I succeeded in completely healing his neck. While this would have been considered very slow by 2150 standards, I was satisfied, having done the very best I could. Before permitting him to regain consciousness, I planted powerful subconscious suggestions of his obedience to me. I sensed that his name was Griff. His pudgy-faced companion, Judd, was still unconscious with a broken jaw, so I resumed my healing efforts. Again, I was able to reach deep into his mind and still the unconscious struggle. Then, working with his gland and nerve centers, I released the great healing forces. His jaw was soon healed, and his mind had accepted my hypnotic control of his actions. He demonstrated his obedience by quietly getting to his feet and going to his motorcycle. Returning Griff to consciousness, I started him toward his motorcycle too. Then, with me riding behind Griff and directing him, we made our way back to the apartment building with Judd close behind. Entering the seldom-used rear door, we made it up the fourth floor without being seen. Once inside the apartment, I told them they could not leave without my permission and suggested that they go to sleep until I awakened them. Walking down to my third floor apartment, I took my weary body to bed. For the first time in almost two months, I went to sleep and did not wake up in 2150. Instead, I had a dream in which I saw Leah standing at the foot of my bed looking sadly down at me. Why do you look so sad? I asked. Because I cannot bring you to 2150 this time, she replied. Your anger has broken the time-space translation loop. What do you mean? I questioned. I mean that your vicious treatment of those two men this morning lowered your vibration rate so much that it is now impossible for us to translate your vibrations into our time dimension, Leah explained. Do you mean that just because I protected that little girl from certain rape and probable murder, I can't return to you and the Macro family? That's impossible. That wouldn't be fair at all, I protested, sure that there had been some mistake. You're right, John. It certainly wouldn't be fair if just protecting the child prevented your translation, she answered. It's not all that simple, though. You protected her not with the love and acceptance of a macro perspective, 
but rather with the hate and rage of your micro-cell. But I couldn't fight them at a macro level. What else could I have done? I asked. At the macro level, she answered, you would not have needed to fight them, only restore the imbalance of their minds. But I couldn't possibly restore the balance to their depraved minds. They're monsters, I defended. So you acquiesced to your limiting beliefs, condemned them for their microviolence, then fought them with your own microviolence, Leah stated. Suddenly I felt an agony of pain in my jaw and neck. I was shocked to find they were broken. Then in my mind I heard the voice of Raina. Pass no judgment and you will not be judged, for as you judge others, so will you yourself be judged, and whatever measure you deal out to others will be dealt back to you in return. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye with never a thought at the great plank in your own? All right, I said, I am experiencing the pain that I inflicted this morning, but they deserved it. Of course they did, Leah replied but only micro-man punishes. You are doomed yourself to live in a micro-world as long as you desire a micro-way of life. Does this mean that I've forfeited my chance to live in the macro-society? I asked. You won't be able to return to 2150 until you balance the negative vibrations you created within your essential self, she explained. If within a month you can succeed in positively balancing today's negative actions, you may return to continue seeking level 3 awareness. However, now that you've broken the time-space translation loop, it will take a great deal of energy to reestablish it. This will probably reduce the amount of time you have left in 2150. I'm so sorry, Leah. I didn't mean to louse things up. I just couldn't help myself. I could do the same thing over and over again. I just mustn't. I've got to grow, and I had better start by balancing the negative vibrations I've set up. How can I do that, Leah? I asked. She smiled sadly. If you don't know the answer to that question by now, John, you might just as well give up hope of experiencing 2150 again in this lifetime. With these words ringing in my mind, I awakened to an excruciating pain in my jaw and neck. Fortunately for me, I had healed my victims so that their pain had not lasted long. I remembered that according to the law of karma, my own pain must soon pass too. Then I realized that my perspective must have suffered a terrible blow, for I hadn't even thought in terms of karma since my first week in 2150. That's when I first learned that karma is only valid from a less-than-macro point of view. As these thoughts entered my mind, the pain began to diminish, and it was not long before I was completely free of the misery I had inflicted upon myself. While I was free of one pain, the thought of being forever separated from my new world would, I knew, prove to be more painful in the long run. Somehow I had to learn how to balance my negative vibrations, and I was sure that my best chance of doing this lay upstairs with the hoodlums I had captured. If I forced them to go to the police and confess the rape murders of the two co-eds, which my probing of their minds had discovered, maybe that would do it. They would be punished, if not by the electric chair, by life terms in one of our prisons. But that kind of angry vengeance usually fills its victims with even more hate, and from the macro perspective, I knew that those who died with hatred often chose quick rebirth in an attempt at revenge. Thus, what microman cannot see, due to his limited life perspective, is that hate and revenge always produce more hate and more revenge. No, I couldn't balance my negativity by using microman's approach to a problem. That was not the solution, but what was? I smiled sadly to myself as I recalled that Microman had been given the solution by all his great macro-philosophers. The so-called Christian nations knew of this as the one commandment that their great master gave, Love one another as I have loved you. Shaking my head, I resigned myself to the fact that this one commandment didn't seem to be very practical from a micro-point of view. However, I had been exposed to a larger point of view, a macro-view, which I must now use to solve the problem and thereby get back to my beloved Leah and 2150. So I couldn't turn my two captives over to the police, but I couldn't turn them loose to continue the murderous path either. Could I, I wondered, could I rehabilitate them? While I had succeeded in using my macro powers to heal them, to safely bring them to the apartment, would I now be able to heal their twisted micro minds? I knew that I could control their mind and force them to do what I commanded, but this would certainly not be rehabilitation not with me acting as a prison warden of their minds. Somehow, I must help them to see their long-term painful and unfulfilling consequences of their micro-existence. 
As I searched my mind for a way of performing this miracle, I loaded a tray with bowls, spoons, a carton of milk, and some granola. I picked up the tray and started off to their apartment. When I entered the room, they were still in their hypnotically induced sleep. I quickly awakened them and got them into the kitchen, where we all sat at the kitchen table. At first they eyed me with fear, but this slowly gave way to puzzled bewilderment as I told them that they were my guests and that I had healed their bodies and was about to try healing their minds. I told them that if we succeeded, they would be free to live satisfying new lives without fear of the police. If we failed, and I emphasized we to begin developing the idea of a joint venture in which they would have at least equal responsibility, then I could promise nothing but a future filled with misery and unhappiness. Griff, the tall one, scratched his head and began pulling on his mustache. Listen, man, he said finally, I don't understand what's happening. How did you get us to come here with you, and how come you haven't called the cops? I wasn't sure how to answer these two questions, so I took my time before saying, I hypnotized you into coming here, and the reason I didn't turn you over to the police is sort of complicated. You see, I know that you raped and murdered those two co-eds, and if I just wanted to punish you, I'd let the police have you. But I'm going to gamble on being able to show you a different type of life, which will prove so attractive that you won't want to hurt anybody ever again. Hey, man, Jed exclaimed. Are you some kind of religious nut? I mean, you're going to save us from our sins? No, I assured him, shaking my head. I'm just going to tell you some things, and if what I say doesn't make sense to you, then I'll turn you loose and you can do whatever you wish. They looked at me suspiciously. Then Griff said, What's stopping us from walking out right now? I told him, That door to the hall is red hot. If you try to open it, you'll get burned. You'll find the same is true of the windows. I could see they didn't consciously believe me. As they both got up, Griff said, You're plumb crazy, man. There's nothing wrong with that door. I think maybe we should be doctoring you. Judd reached the door first and started to open it, but as soon as his hand touched the doorknob, he let out a scream and jerked backwards. Yeah, Judd wailed as he frantically waved his hand in the air, trying to cool it. God damn it! That crazy bastard's right! Look at my hand! He held his reddened hand out for Griff to examine. Griff apparently accepted the reality of Judd's pain, for he turned to me and said sarcastically, Okay, man, how the hell you managed that little trick? I hypnotized you into believing the door was red hot. There was nothing you could do about it, because I was working on your subconscious mind, not your conscious one. As long as your subconscious mind holds my suggestion, you won't be able to get out that door. Judd, still holding his hand, glared at me and said, Well, if it's all in my head, then how come I've got these goddamn blisters on my hand? Because your body can only do what your mind directs it to do, I answered. Your mind believes your hand is burned, so it directs your nerves to signal pain and your gland system to produce blisters. Okay, man, Griff nodded. We'll buy the science lecture. But how about you knocking off this messing around with our minds? You were lucky this morning. You don't think you can take on both of us at the same time, do you? I mean, we bust you in half. Oh, I made a mistake this morning, I admitted, and I'm paying for it. But I'm not going to fight you again. You mean you're just going to stand there and let us tear you up? Judd sneered. I can just see that. Sure you are. No, sir. You fight like a madman. You did this morning, and you'll do it again first time we lift a fist. No, I won't, I responded. I don't have to. From now on, if either of you tries to harm anyone, you'll only succeed in doing it to yourself. They looked at me skeptically, so I said, If you haven't learned to believe me, you can try and see for yourself. I'm warning you, though, that you'll only hurt yourself. Bash him one, Griff, Judd urged. Cause bluff. Huh. So he can get hurt like you did? I asked. Griff approached me warily and with obvious uncertainty. Finally, he sidled up to within striking distance and began giving me what he clearly hoped was a frightening stare. I remained standing and smiled at him. Remember, I said, you've been warned that any harm you try to do to anyone else will only happen to you. Okay, Griff said. I believe you, man. I wouldn't think of hurting you. With these words, he pretended to turn away, but when he was half-turned, he suddenly let go of the twisting uppercut of my jaw. It had a tremendous force, as Griff soon discovered for his fist missed my chin and like a boomerang came crashing back to his own jaw, knocking him off balance so that he fell heavily to the floor. What the hell? Judd exclaimed. You didn't even move and Griff knocked himself down. What the hell's happening? I told you, but you refused to believe me. How badly do you have to hurt yourselves before you start believing me? 
Griff had climbed to his feet and gingerly touched his sore jaw. He came at me fiercely, but stopped just short of my body. A combination of rage and puzzled amazement filled his eyes. Drawing up his fist, he hesitated, then sticking out his index finger, poking at my chest, the pokes, of course, landed on his own befuddled self. He eyed me thoughtfully. I had a feeling that he was getting ready to give some genuine consideration to what I had to say. You've seen that if you think something is true, it is real in its consequences, I said. Well, I'm trying to show you that the way we think causes everything that happens to us. If we think negatively, it has negative results for us. If we think positively, it has positive results. Crap, Judd exclaimed. Now we get a sermon on the power of positive thinking, right? No, I said. I'm going to give you a demonstration. From now on, every angry thought that you have about anything for any reason will cause a violent headache that will last only as long as your angry thoughts. Oh, Jesus, keep rice, man, Judd cried as he clutched his forehead. What's wrong? Griff asked. That son of a bitch is sticking daggers into my head, Judd shouted. Oh, it's killing me. Stop it, stop it. You're the only one who could stop it, Judd, I explained. When you stop thinking angry thoughts at me, the pain will stop. Do as he says, Judd, Griff advised. That bastard's got a hex on us. I guess that you better do like he says. The pain seemed to have reached the point where Judd could only think of it, and the angry thoughts were crowded out of his mind by thoughts of how to get rid of the pain. His face, which had been distorted by the pain, now gradually relaxed, and he gave a sigh of relief as he wiped his forehead with his shirt sleeve. There, I said, all you had to do was stop your angry thoughts, and the headache stopped too. Now I'm going to leave you so you can think about what I've said. If you still have any doubts about the truth of my statements, you can test them out. Any questions before I leave? Yeah, man, Griff said. How long you plan on keeping us here? Well, you've got enough cereal milk to last till tomorrow morning. I'll be back then, I answered. You're keeping us here just like the pigs keep people in jail, Griff protested and spit at me. A split second later, he was wiping his face with one hand while the other held his throbbing forehead. He howled. I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. Damn it, I'm, I'm sorry, I said. You don't have to convince me, I responded. Just convince yourself that you aren't angry and your headache will go away. We'll see you tomorrow. Here's wishing you loving, happy thoughts. With those words, I left them and walked down to Carl and Nada's apartment. By this time, it was mid-afternoon, and I was just in time to be invited to late luncheon, which Nada had prepared. Since I hadn't eaten anything yet, I let Carl and Nada do most of the talking while I concentrated on reducing my hunger pangs. Then I told them about my experiences so far that day. As I had expected, Carl favored turning my captives over to the police. He wasn't at all happy about having two rapists in the same building as his new wife. Scooting his chair closer to hers, Carl put his arms around her protectively. Nada, however, supported my arguments for trying to rehabilitate them. After all, Carl, she kept repeating, Look what John did for me. If he can make a silk purse out of an ugly sow's ears like I was, why couldn't he work a miracle with those hoodlums? Oh, yeah, Carl replied. Well, I've learned something about John's macro philosophy, and I know, and John will agree, that you can't help anyone who doesn't want to be helped. The person has to actively cooperate. He couldn't have helped you if you hadn't had sufficient desire and belief. That's true, I agreed. Nada had to desire and believe in the possibility of the changes that took place in order for them to become permanent. See there, Carl said, waving his spoon in the air. You're licked before you get started with those hoodlums because they sure don't desire to suddenly become model citizens, much less believe it's possible. Well, you're right about that, Carl, I conceded. As of now, they certainly lack the desire and belief. But by tomorrow, they're going to be thinking twice before they doubt the truth of anything I say. And tomorrow, I'm going to start teaching the macro philosophy. That's ridiculous, Carl argued. Why, they're the lowest type of scum on the face of this micro-earth. And you said over and over that macro-perspective doesn't make sense to micro-man. In fact, from a micro-view, a concept such as all is one is simply not true. Why waste your time, John? Why don't we just turn them over to the police? You don't want to mess around with people like that. They're sicker in hell. And they're damn dangerous, too. They don't deserve... Are you about to say that those young men don't deserve help? I interrupted. If so, I warn you to be careful how you judge them. Remember the warning words that Raina quoted and consider your judgment carefully before you condemn yourself, too, as being unworthy of rehabilitation. Carl opened his mouth to reply, but Nada quickly put her finger to his lips. Please, Carl, she asked. Think about what John said. After all, he has been cut off from 2150 for just thinking such condemning thoughts. That's about as much tragedy as we need for one day. 
native had certain natural persuasive advantages that i had never had with carl so i wasn't surprised to see him nod his head and yield to her point by the way carl i said would you mind if nada typed up my journal by the end of this week i am hoping that our new house guests will be ready to consider what i've written here if they can believe it then maybe they'll want to start learning how to live a macro life nada wanted to start on it right away but by the time our discussion ended the day was gone and evening had arrived when i left them i was convinced that nada far more than i had gotten carl to accept comfortably the major tenets of the macro of society and macro philosophy i retired early that evening knowing that i wouldn't be awakening in twenty one fifty but planning an early start with griffin jett the next three days were some of the most frustrating i've ever experienced it seems that my two captives had headaches most of the time which made them angry which gave them headaches which made them angry and so on in their frustrated rage they tried to attack me a number of times and of course ended up just hurting themselves they even burned their hands on the door a couple more times at first i was astonished at the amount of pain they were willing to put up with rather than learn the simple lessons i had given them finally i realized that a lifetime habit of running away from responsibility for one's own life situation is not quickly overcome both griff and judd were experts at repressing or forgetting unpleasant details so they kept forgetting that their own anger produced headaches that the door was burning hot and that if they tried to hit me they would only hit themselves instead of course if they hadn't been so angry at their inability to escape they would have learned much faster but as rena had once explained all anger is self-anger caused by calling something bad and then feeling inadequate to change the bad or undesirable situation she had continued saying that since micro man usually refuses to accept responsibility for his unpleasant experiences he unconsciously projects the blame onto others then he feels justified in projecting his self-anger and self-hate upon them too since these denial of reality techniques work temporarily and microman forgets that they are only temporary this type of behavior continues to become an even stronger habit until it is extremely difficult to change this pernicious it's not my fault cycle was what i was seeing in griffin judd looking at my own life i could see this pattern repeated over and over again i not only had my present life to examine but a number of past lives too which all bore out the same lesson all my problems were self-caused due to my refusal to accept this macro truth all learning is based on remembering accepting the learning value of one's mistakes once more the ancient truth he who forgets his past is doomed to repeat it carl had warned me at the end of the first day that i had better be able to live by the same conditions i forced on my captives i had assured him that i was perfectly willing to experience a headache any time i gave in to my micro habit of anger i had felt confident that from any larger perspective it would be impossible for me to get angry i didn't realize that all dissatisfaction produces some anger in other words to the extent that i saw anything as being more bad than good i felt angry and by the second day i was experiencing headaches my own i'd realized that from the macro perspective everything is both bad and good ugly and beautiful failure and success but i hadn't realized how inadequate i was to actually practice seeing both sides of the coin or the balanced macro view i who had devised what i thought was a brilliant scheme for motivating my captives to learn how to think more positively was now caught in my own device by the end of the third day we were running neck and neck for who had the biggest headache grip judd or me i was willing to bet that i won by a head ache fortunately things got better on the fourth day this was caused by a number of things but an important factor was nada when nada saw how miserable i was on my third evening she begged carl and me to let her visit griffin judd taking with her the tight pages of this journal both carl and i opposed this but nada insisted that anything they did to harm her would reflect right back to themselves instead so she couldn't possibly get hurt i argued that it was a chance i was just not willing to take unfortunately arguing with nada only made my headache worse which made me think that maybe she was right so i gave in with a stipulation that i act as her guard while carl held out longer i could see that nada's lovely persuasiveness was too much for him she visited my captives with me as her guardian i had asked nada to open the door to their apartment for i was living my own sentence so completely the doorknob now burned my hands too nada proved so thoroughly charming that griff and judd were soon over their headaches she managed to prolong her stay by beginning to read my journal to us 
I was sure that neither of them was ready to accept this journal as anything more than ridiculous fantasy. But with Nada reading it and interrupting herself to make comments and to clarify or to answer their questions, both Griff and Judd were soon so deeply involved in my journal experiences that they didn't want Nada to stop reading. I suggested it was getting late, but it was only after Nada promised to come back the following day and finish reading the journal that they were willing to accept her departure. The next day, Nada spent almost six hours with Griff and Judd and still didn't finish reading this journal because they asked her so many questions about herself and about the changes that had taken place in her. I was surprised at how little skepticism they showed, although Nada got me to demonstrate some of the macro powers for them. They were most impressed by my PK levitations in which I floated some sofa pillows around the room, and they remembered that I had healed the injuries that I had inflicted on them. I had also healed their burned hands at Nada's suggestion. From then on, we had no problems with the door. They didn't approach it, and it didn't burn me anymore. By the end of the fourth day, I was convinced that Nada was a tremendous help to me in getting through to Griffin Judd. I was still amazed at the great personality change in Nada. She was confident, outgoing, patient, kind, and most surprising of all, full of humor, joy, and laughter. When I asked about these psychological changes, she responded, I'm the living, breathing proof to myself that your macro philosophy of the future can overcome any problem. But knowing about Griffin Judd, aren't you afraid of them? I asked. Nada laughed. As long as I can remember my past, I can't imagine being too upset by anything in the future. Wait a minute, I interrupted. How about being raped and murdered? She shook her head playfully and said, I'm sorry if my lack of fear worries you and Carl, but I'm not being foolhardy. I just believe in your macro philosophy, which says that this is a perfectly just universe and we can experience only what we have chosen to experience. Everyone will eventually learn the truth that all is one. So, in the long run, the future can only get better, more aware, and more loving. Nothing can happen to me except what I have chosen to grow from. So, what's there to fear? I still don't understand how you could have learned to practice this macro view so quickly, I replied, shaking my head. Didn't you tell me that all human problems are caused by resisting and fighting the inevitable changes in our lives? She reminded. Yes, I did. However, I... Then try to understand, she interrupted. Try to understand that I have so many changes taking place in my life that I've learned to enjoy it. Well, what if you're in an accident, I postulated. Then you lose your newly acquired physical beauty. Could you accept that change? Yes, she answered. I think I could, because now I know what it is, a vehicle. Why I have it. We created it through your, our belief in a philosophy of oneness, and why I don't have it if it's taken from me, because I caused and chose it. I fully believe, John, that as long as I want this body, I'll have it. Now, that takes care of beliefs, and it sounds like you have the desire, too, I observed. With those two, you can have anything you want as long as you don't cancel it with a conflicting desire or belief. I used to have a strong desire to be beautiful and happy, she said, and I didn't believe it was possible. This made me want to stay away from others so they wouldn't see how homely I was. My desire to avoid rejection by not becoming involved was so great that I canceled out my desire to be beautiful and happy. It sounds so complicated when we put it into words that I don't see how we're ever able to explain it to Griff and Judd, I sighed. Nada teased me, saying, It's because you lack sufficient belief, John, but I believe it's possible and I desire to accomplish it, so I will succeed. I laughed. You beat me at my own game, Nada. I'm going to watch your technique for the next few days. You're probably the answer to my cry for help during those frustrating first three days. Ask and you shall receive. Hmm. Well, I asked and here you are, Nada, so I better get out of the way and let you do your thing. I had given myself a week to begin seeing some sign of greater awareness in my captives, and I really hadn't expected any dramatic changes. However, by Sunday, just one week after I'd captured them, Griff and Judd behaved so differently that at times I had difficulty believing they were the same men who had attacked three girls, raped, and killed two of them. Nada had made the big difference. She had gotten them to listen to her and accept her. Then she had persuaded them to accept me. I don't mean that Griff and Judd were ready to live at a macro level by any means, because you learn by doing, and even a week as intensive and challenging as the one they had just finished didn't give them enough practice to balance years that went before. However, they had made a beginning and an entirely new way of thinking, and it was already showing surprising results. Griff had at first been very depressed at learning about reincarnation and how our soul selects lessons to balance our learning experiences. What hope for the future have we got? 
If what you're telling us is true, we'll probably be born girls next time and get raped and murdered, he reluctantly observed. When I explained that this was only true if they refused to evolve to a more macro perspective where karma, as popularly defined, did not apply. You mean, Judd asked, there's a way of escaping that damned karma thing? Well, I answered, the law of karma is only a problem to microman because he had more hate or negative thoughts and actions than positive loving ones. At the macro level, people live by the law of love, which does not include penance. Its basis is joyous acceptance of whatever is as perfectly chosen by each soul for its own development. They kept asking questions about the law of love until Nada said, If you can lovingly accept everything that happens to you, then nothing bad or unpleasant will be a part of your future. Well, how in the world does a person learn to do that? Griff asked. By wanting to learn it, Nada replied, and by believing that you can learn it. Griff kept asking questions, and Nada and I kept trying to answer until Griff surprised us by saying that he'd like a notebook and a pen so he could start writing these ideas down. Once he started writing, he stayed up most of the night creating his own journal about macro philosophy and how it might be used to rebuild his own life. During the past couple of days of that week, we had almost no headaches. Griff and Judd were both demonstrating greater awareness. Still, Carl questioned their sincerity. After all, he cautioned, they know that all they have to do is pretend to listen to everything you say and then promise to live the kind of life you expect of them and you'll let them go. But they really mean it, Nada assured him. How do you know, said Carl. Don't forget these guys are probably expert liars and wouldn't know the truth if you hit them on the head with it. Oh, Carl, you wouldn't be so skeptical if you spent all the hours with them that John and I have. Besides, we can always be sure of their progress by having John look at their auras. Is that true, John? Well, I replied, I haven't looked at their auras since I first saw them because they were so depressing, but I'll give it a try tomorrow. Telepathically, I see that they're coming along amazingly well. However, if their auras show that they're lying, I'll keep them here. But if they pass your aura test with pretty colors, you'll let them go tomorrow? Exactly. Of course, I'll invite them back for more personal evolution tutoring at least several times a week for a while. Well, I'll be, I said, amazed at my new realization. I'm a P.E. tutor. You believe that, Carl? A and Nada. She is, too. It's amazing. Simply amazing. On Sunday, both Nada and Carl spent most of the day talking with Griff and Judd while I devoted my energies to observing their auras. By the middle of the afternoon, I had watched them as they had answered seemingly endless questions put to them by Carl. They had become angry occasionally, but only briefly, though I felt that Carl had pushed them pretty hard at times. Still, their auras looked much cleaner and sharper than they had been only seven days earlier. At last, I asked them the biggest question of all. Would you like to stay here another week? There was a long silence while they looked at each other, then back at Nada, Carl, and myself. Finally, Judd cleared his throat and said, I've learned an awful lot this past week. I guess I'd like to stick around for a while longer, if it's all right. Then we all looked at Griff, who was staring intently at the floor. I saw Carl start to say something, but he caught Nada's eye and changed his mind. We all waited. Then Griff raised his head and looked intently into my eyes. I want to leave. I've got it written down in my journal that you learn by practicing, by doing. And out there is where we'll find out how much we've really learned this past week. I can't find that out up here four floors above the rest of the world. First Nada kissed Griff, then Judd, while I watched Carl's neck. But he didn't say anything. Then I said, I promised you both that once you had listened to what I had to say, you could leave. And I'm not going to start lying to you now. I hope that you'll come back, Griff to talk with Nada and me several times a week for a while, but that's up to you. Hearing this invitation and being assured that it applied also to him, Judd decided that he would go with Griff, but they both wanted to come back and talk with us some more, soon and often. On that note, I removed the hypnotic blocks which had turned their anger into headaches and the doorknob into fire, and we bade them goodbye. I accompanied Nada and Carl down to their apartment, where we spent the rest of the day until late evening discussing and digesting the past week's experience, lessons, and contemplating possible futures. Going to sleep that night, I decided that I agreed with what Nada had said earlier about the week. It was the most important learning experience of my life because I took the biggest risks, made the biggest mistakes, and attained some important successes. I then employed the 2150 custom of closing the day with praise for having taken the risks necessary to grow that day and reaffirmation of my lifestyle plan for growth in the future.